Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you very much indeed, um, all of you, for coming along to the, the launch of, of this report. Uh, can I say a, a special word of welcome to um, former Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe? It's a very great pleasure to see you here, sir, um, and to also our friends and colleagues from the media. And what I'm going to do is I will outline uh, this report to you, and then I'll take some questions from the media. Um, and then I know we'll have a chance for some informal discussion later as well. The problem of climate change is now almost universally understood and acknowledged. This itself is a major achievement. But now is the moment to get serious about the solution. Such a solution has to be global. It has to include America and China. It has to be radical. It must put the world on a path away from carbon dependence to a new and green economy. It has to be realistic. It has to take account of the completely legitimate right of people, especially the world's poorest, to enjoy the benefits of economic growth and prosperity that should be spread to all. There has been a, a vast amount of work to get us to here. The United Nations process, led brilliantly and often heroically by Ivo de Boer, has set out the international community's roadmap to a deal, which will culminate in the negotiation in Copenhagen in December 2009. The IPCC panel of experts, led with such distinction by Dr. Pachuri, has examined and laid out the scientific consensus. Here in Japan, we can see how the political agenda has been shaped and changed, first by Prime Minister Abe's Cool Earth policy, and now under the leadership of Prime Minister Fukuda, who leads this year's G8. Ours is a different type of report. It's a report drawn up by experts, but guided by a politician. And our work is split into two phases. Phase one is for this year's G8, Phase two will be for next year's. Phase one is an attempt to clarify and bring order to the agenda for the solution. Phase two will attempt to set out what this solution should be. Phase one is in part analytical and technical. In part, it is about how to make sense of the political process. Essentially, it's about trying to unite the scientists and the experts with the political leaders and decision makers. As such, it is explicitly designed to be a practical way through, not yet another campaigning polemic to wake up the world to the challenges of global warming. The world has woken up. What it now needs to know is what to do. The report warns of the danger of a yawning chasm between, on the one hand, the calls for radical action from scientists, environmental groups, and people rightly alarmed at the effect of greenhouse gas emissions on our planet, and on the other, the anxiety of decision makers in politics and business who share the aims of this radical action, but worry about whether that action is realistic. Long term, Everyone accepts that the needs of the economy and the needs of the environment operate in partnership. Short term, there is a clear tension, and we live in the short term. The report, therefore, tries to design a way to bridge that chasm. There is a, a blunt reality that we need to acknowledge amongst all the talk of targets and goals and obligations. The climate demands over time a radical, transformative change in the nature of the world economy, moving from growth built on carbon dependence to environmentally sustainable development. But we need to be clear about the size of this task. US emissions are still growing, so are those in Japan. In Europe, they're static. China and India are set rightly to industrialize and move their vast 
hundreds of millions of poor people from subsistence agriculture to the modern economy. Now, we're talking about a global 2050 target of at least a 50% cut in emissions. But let's be clear. This date is decades away and decades beyond the political life of any government. The key challenge is actually to describe a realistic pathway to that goal. And that implies shorter term goals. But these are immensely demanding, asking developed economies to move from growth in emissions to significant cuts within 10 to 15 years. Europe has very bold 2020 targets, and it will take very bold action to achieve them. The recent Warner-Lieberman bill before the US Senate implied 5% cuts in US emissions by 2020. That would be a big step forward. But according to some scientists, it falls short of the cuts necessary for world emissions to peak in 2020. China has set a target of a 20% cut in energy intensity by 2010, and that is a huge step forward. But it's again immensely demanding, and even if met, would not cut overall emissions given China's need to grow. India, again wanting to act, also wants to grow. The point I'm making is the challenge is truly profound. One thing I've learned in this report is that this challenge is as technically and scientifically complex, as politically sensitive, and as institutionally fraught as any the international community has had to deal with since the post-war Bretton Woods economic settlement. And above all, and here is the point, it should be noted our knowledge of this issue is constantly evolving. Though we talk as if the science were certain, its overall purport may be, the precise details are often open to substantial debate. Therefore, what this report proposes is this. It proposes an approach to the Copenhagen Agreement at the end of 2009 that does not attempt to deal that tries to resolve all the issues up to 2050 or even to 2030 or 2020, but instead begins a process that will then undergo necessary revision and adjustment as our knowledge improves and the facts become clearer. So we propose, one, set a clear direction in Copenhagen, get the action underway. Do not try to put a spurious precision on each and every aspect, set a realistic target, get the change started, make Copenhagen the beginning but not the end of a process that will require constant adjustment over the years. Two, carry on through to next year's G8, the informal process whereby G8 and the developing world major economies continue to try to resolve core questions. Together the G8 plus five or the major economies meeting, represent three quarters of the global emissions. A steer from them is an essential precondition of this deal. And this doesn't supplant the UN process, it supports it. And thirdly, as we've discovered, or as I've discovered, there are a plethora of really tricky questions that need answering before a serious negotiation can work. We detail these in the report. It's surely wise to commission work and research on them now, making full use of the enormous range of non-governmental bodies, institutes, and experts, many of whom already contribute to the UN's work. So the G8 should agree a work plan through to next year to get this work done. I mean, just to give you some small examples, large issues, but small examples. How do we raise the money that is going to be necessary for technology, for deforestation, for helping developing countries? Is there a place for auctioning credits? If so, how would it work? Is the clean development mechanism the right mechanism? Can it be reformed? How do carbon markets link up? 
should the developing world have access to them? How do we transfer technology? Do we need a new intellectual property right regime? In this phase one, we have identified the 10 building blocks of a global deal. A global target, an interim target, develop world commitments and carbon markets, developing world contributions, sectoral action, financing, technology, forests, adaptation, and institutions and mechanisms of action. And what we've done under each head is to try and isolate the key elements that will need agreement and the further work to clarify each of them. One of the other things we've done in this report is also to try to identify significant facts whose significance in a practical way often gets lost. For example, energy efficiency would provide one quarter of the gains necessary and incidentally save money. So it requires special focus. The vast majority of new power stations in China and India will be coal-fired. Not maybe, will be coal-fired. So developing carbon capture and storage technology is not optional. It's literally of the essence. Without at least some countries engaging in a substantial renaissance of nuclear power, it's hard to see how any global deal is going to work. For developing countries to grow sustainably, they will need funds and technology. Otherwise, they will not be able to peak and then reduce emissions within the necessary timescale. Deforestation amounts to around 15 to 20 percent of the entire emissions problem. Certain key sectors like cement, steel, and of course, most of all, power, account for a huge percentage, almost half of all emissions. Airline and shipping emissions, though only 5% today, are fast growing. Done right, the costs of abatement will be manageable, probably less than predicted, and there are potentially real opportunities for the new low carbon economy that will develop. The point is, all of these intensely practical questions require to be answered if we're to put a global deal together. And in the end, this is the question. What is it reasonable to ask countries to do on their own? And then what more could be done if the right partnership was in place for a global deal? In other words, how do we, by use of global mechanisms in a global agreement, accelerate the process of change in individual countries? Because there may be a gap between what it is reasonable to do and what is necessary for the climate to survive. And the global deal is about eliminating that gap. The aim of phase two of the report will be to try to show how the building blocks can be arranged in a cohesive global deal. In particular, we will try to bridge the chasm earlier described between the entirely understandable demands for radical action to save the environment and the equally understandable desire for countries to enjoy economic growth and prosperity in a world in which the majority at present are still poor. Finally, some good news. It's clear that this deal can be done. Indeed, it's clear that long term, there are going to be real benefits in doing it. But short term, we need to get the elements in place. And we need to get them in place fast. And that's what this report is designed to help. Thank you very much.